All right. Welcome to the penultimate energy symposium of fall 2019. Uh, the last talk for this semester will be next week. It will be Barbara Finnamore, who is senior, senior attorney and senior director for Asia at the Natural Resources Defense Council. And her topic of her talk will be, Will China Save the Planet? So try not to predetermine the answer, uh, but think about that for next week. So I expect a very good talk next week. Today we have Joel Landry from Penn State uh, University. Uh, Joel is Assistant Professor of Environmental and Energy Economics at Penn State, and his research involves looking at welfare implications, political economy dimensions of uh, public policies and public choice, uh, and that targets specific uh, or large and significant market failures, and he'll be talking about climate policy today. So he's particular focus on climate change, energy, transportation, uh, and urban sector policy. So uh, it's a great pleasure to have him here. And if he can remember to uh, perhaps tell his joke about whether he should title uh, <laughs> something in his talk, uh, green pork. Uh, he might bring up the, the phrase green pork. Uh, so we can learn what that is. And you can come up with your own Dr. Seuss rhyme to understand that. But we may let him do that. Uh, so uh, let's welcome Joel here today uh, and thank him for coming. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure and honor to be here. Thank you, Carrie, for the warm introductions. Um, and thank you for the um, great meetings I've had today, learning a lot about the really interesting work that's being done at UT Austin, the energy, environment, climate space. Uh, it's a real honor to be here with you. <clears throat> the original title of this paper was going to be, as uh, Carrie suggested, Green Pork and I Ams. And I had this entire quote of Dr. Seuss. <laughs> Um, involving, you know, I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like green eggs and ham. <coughs> and of course, and at the very end of the book, he decides to try green eggs and ham, and then he turns out he actually likes the taste of green eggs and ham. Um, and of course, his name is Sam, which is perfect because the icon historically of uh, U.S. politics has been Uncle Sam. And so, I, uh, the whole idea here of this paper is if we come to love green pork. Uh, potentially, um, Uncle Sam could pass climate policy. So that was the general thrust. But uh, I didn't think that would work <laughs> for, uh, for a journal. So I, I changed it to this more, far, far more interesting and perhaps uh, esoteric title, Political Permanent Allocations and the Feasibility of Federal Climate Policy. So uh, if many of you are awake and alive in the United States, uh, federal efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions have uh, comprehensive efforts have by and large failed. Uh, I use the word abject failure. Uh, there have been several attempts, <coughs> starting originally in the Senate, all those uh, didn't even pass the Senate. Um, the only policy that has come closest to uh, succeeding was the American Clean Energy and Security Act of 2009, or the waxman marquee Climate Bill. And you may ask yourself, well, why should we waste our time thinking about a climate policy from 2009? Um, I'm going to hopefully try and convince you as to why that is. Uh, because it allows me to actually uh, <clears throat> recover how legislators think about climate change um, and potentially use that to simulate alternative policies that may actually be able to pass the U.S. Congress. Um, <clears throat> under ASESA, negotiations over the cap were explicitly linked to the allocation of permits to sectors uh, that were connected to politically important districts. So the policy started with Henry Waxman in the House Energy and Commerce Committee and <clears throat> these other individuals were members of that committee, and they uh, entered into negotiations with Waxman. Uh, one of them, Rick, Rick Boucher of, of, of Virginia, uh, an ally of the coal industry, was willing to uh, make a quid pro quo, if you will, given the topic of the day, which many of you may be watching rather than my talk, uh, <laughs> uh, would be willing to exchange, uh, uh, willing to support a more stringent cap, okay, if they got more permits. Um, and in fact, he was able to succeed in getting 35% of the permits allocated to his district. Uh, likewise, where I'm from, Mike Doyle in the Rust Belt uh, requested 15% of permits for trade vulnerable industries. And where not too far from here, Houston, uh, but maybe far enough for Austinites, uh, Gene Green received 2% for oil refineries. So you can think of these are allocations that were trying to target certain industrial sectors that are relevant to certain legislatures. Um, but which they don't have the entirety of the market share. Uh, I'm going to argue that this sectoral allocation mechanism for allocating permits 
uh, may have been what led to the failure of ASESA. And if we were to relax <coughs> possibly this allocation mechanism and embrace green pork, uh, I'll define what I mean by that in a second, uh, potentially uh, we might observe a federal climate policy that could pass both chambers of Congress. Uh, so what do I mean by green pork? Well, when we think about a cap and trade system, we're imposing a cap on greenhouse gas emissions across certain sectors of the economy. Um, we then are going to divide that cap or the total amount of permits equal to that cap um, to various individuals or economic agents or legislative districts. <coughs> okay? um, and in some cases, you might allocate them freely or you might auction them. Okay? Or you might come up with some other rule that can determine how permits are allocated across across the, uh, the economic agents in, in, in the society. Okay? Fundamentally though, uh, those permits are just uh, really a piece of paper which you can then trade in the cap and trade system. Okay? And of course you're going to trade them at an equilibrium permit price, um, which itself is a function of the level of stringency of the cap that ends up getting chosen. Okay? So you can think of uh, any sort of attempt to regulate an externality, uh, an environmental bad, um, such as greenhouse gas emissions, as both delivering benefits of reducing okay, uh, <coughs> that environmental bad, but it's also co-producing this giant, beautiful pile of money, uh, or transfers, or green pork, as we might call it. Um, I'm going to call this green pork, in the, in, the, in the historical sort of U.S. usage of this term, of pork barrel politics, um, for those of you who uh, are, are coming from a non-U.S. audience, I've discovered that that idea of pork is not, that you, is not as, as ubiquitous as I once assumed it was. Uh, this is this idea that the legislative process, uh, you want to bring home the bacon to your district. Okay? You want to be able to show to your constituents that you delivered some project, uh, some money, uh, that then has value to those districts, and that's why, <coughs> excuse me, you should remain in office. Okay? I'm going to argue in the environmental space when we talk about cap and trade systems and these allocation of permits, okay, we can actually think of that as another type of, of this, this type of pork. Okay? Unlike conventional pork where we have a trade-off, if, 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 uh, if, I, if I get the project in my district, if I get the uh, investment in my district, you're not going to get it. Uh, in the case of climate change, it's certainly going to be true in the case of permits, but all districts are going to also achieve this benefit of, of, of greenhouse gas emissions mitigation, okay, the environmental benefit. Okay. What this is going to mean is that we're going to have some strange bedfellows okay, that sort of emerge from the winning coalition of legislators that's likely to support uh, the cap. Okay. In particular, we're likely to see uh, green pork and the cap be linked to the legislative process, and that's going to mean that we're going to see a cap that reflects hijacking. That is, some legislators may be willing to support the cap and trade system, okay, uh, because they especially value the emissions reductions that they are expected to be achieved. So they may be, they may really uh, believe the damages from climate change are significant. Uh, they, it's also likely to be supported by climate moderates, uh, who may not necessarily value those emissions reductions, but value the green pork or permits that their district is going to receive, okay. And because of these two forces exist. Um, the cap that emerged through the legislative process <clears throat> may not be what we as economists might consider the optimal cap, okay, reflecting what we might call political failure. Uh, so in this paper, I, I try and look at four different research questions. How does the choice of allocation rule affect the ability of the policy to, uh, that emerges through the federal legislative process to pass both chambers of Congress? This is the issue of feasibility. Can the climate policy pass? The second question is, how does the choice of allocation rule affect the efficiency or the conditional efficiency of the policy that's selected? Third, how does the choice of the rule affect the equity of the policy, both horizontally across yes and no voting districts, as well as vertically in terms of the average impact on income? And then I also, there's been some discussion in the popular press recently as to whether, <coughs> for example, we should lower the Senate vote threshold or otherwise pass climate policy through budget rec reconciliation and avoid the 60% filibuster threshold that's currently present in the Senate. Um, I'm also going to consider, I'm going to simulate whether that's a good idea or not. I'm also going to consider the impacts uh, of instead of originating the policy in the House, originating it in the Senate, um, as well as mixed allocation rules. I'm going to be interested in these fundamental trade-offs between feas feasibility, efficiency, and the equity of, of these, these different policies. Um, the way I do this is I build a multi-market equilibrium model of the U.S. economy that reflects uh, several different economic sectors and also accounts 
uh, for greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and it counts for the spatial net benefits of climate policies across congressional and Senate districts. And I'm going to link this with tools from political economy where I explicitly model the legislative process called legislative bargaining models. <coughs> um, I'm then going to functionally invert this model of, uh, of federal policy making um, and try and use that to recover uh, what legislators would have to uh, believe or value the damages from climate change in order to justify their observed votes given the net impacts of the climate policy on their constituents conditional on the permits that they also receive. Okay? I'm going to also relax some of the assumptions in estimating that parameter by coupling it with Pew survey data where functionally we've, the Pew uh, organization has asked individuals how uh, their beliefs with respect to climate change is a serious or not serious problem. Okay? Um, I'm then gonna, that's going to then provide me a measure of how legislators think about the benefits of climate change to their district. Uh, critically, it's not going to require or assume uh, what I think they should use or what mod most economists would recommend that they should use, which would be something close to the global social cost of carbon, which is a measure of the global planetary damages from reducing greenhouse gas emissions by one ton. Um, typically, that's what is considered as what should be used by policymakers in rulemaking and other contexts. I'm not going to assume that policymakers internalize such a social cost of carbon. They may, not, they may have severe doubts. They may have other things that they worry about that they don't care about, and that's going to potentially drive their decisions. Okay? Um, given that parameter, I can then simulate alternative policies that could potentially pass the House of Representatives. Okay. Um, just sort of summarize where we're headed in, the, in terms of the results. The ability to politically allocate permits uh, to secure electoral support is going to be critical for climate policy to pass both chambers of Congress. Indeed, Uncle Sam, once he tastes green pork, if he is interested on in passing a climate policy, he can do it uh, as long as he's willing to embrace the green pork. Okay? Uh, second, this comes at trade-offs in terms of the efficiency of the cap that's likely to be selected through the legislative process. I'm going to find that the hijacking distortion is going to be significant. That's likely to lead to us uh, selecting a cap that may be more stringent than we uh, might anticipate using a central estimate of the social cost of carbon. And critically, because of this political allocation mechanism for allocating permits, uh, this means that those who don't believe in climate change or who are disproportionately likely to bear the largest impacts or costs of mitigating under the cap and trade system, they're not going to receive a significant portion of permits. So to the extent that that's correlated with income, which I find in the model, that's going to mean that the, the federal policy, it may be feasible, not so efficient, um, but it's not going to be very equitable. In fact, it's going to be quite regressive. Okay? Um, I, and then in addition, I don't find... I find an explicit three-way trade-off, basically, from relaxing some of these other policy interventions. Okay, so we could uh, lower the Senate vote threshold. We could originate the policy in the Senate. We could also set aside some permits for redistributive purposes, um, <coughs> but that's going to come at a trade-off of less feasibility. Okay, and so if your goal is just to get a policy passed, that's going to be a trade-off that you're going to be concerned with. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go over the literature, but there's a robust literature that's looked at classic models of pork barrel spending. Baron and Farrajon is one of the more famous ones. Um, <coughs> and this is sort of an idea that we have some fixed budget of money. How do I allocate it to, uh, to different legislative districts to, to pay for different government programs in those districts? Okay? The context that we're examining in this context in which many environmental chat problems are attempting to be addressed through the legislative process are actually not that system or don't reflect that context. It's actually a situation in which an attempt to both address the environmental bad um, also provide or produce some local public goods to districts. That's the green pork and that's, uh, that leads to different legislative out outcomes and implications. Uh, there have been other discussions in the environmental economics literature on other ways we can allocate permits to enhance the efficiency or uh, deal with other unintended impacts of cap and trade systems practically. Those are important. I'm not going to say they're not. <clears throat> um, but that's going to come, if, to the extent that you set aside permits for those purposes, that's going to come uh, at the cost of feasibility. Okay? Uh, an important paper in this space that has actually looked at the, how the political allocation of permits has led to the cap and trade system, ha, ha, has affected the cap that emerges through the political process, is a paper by Josko and Shimalinzi in 1998, 
which actually looks at the only feasible federal cap and trade system that is currently in place, the uh, acid raid program established by the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments. Okay? That process also used a political allocation mechanism to uh, obtain the, uh, to, uh, to, su to succeed. Um, and I'm going to skip the rest. Okay, uh, so I develop a model. Each district is going to have a consumer which reflects their total uh, demand uh, for, for a numerare or general economic good uh, from capital and labor. Uh, they're going to have a representative producer, which basically reflects their local economy. I'm not going to go into all the details since uh, I suspect my audience may not be dominated by economists, so I'm going to perhaps skip some of these for the sake of time. Okay? Um, fundamentally to say, we're considering seven economic sectors, and we generate emissions across these seven e economic sectors. And different districts are going to have different levels of the national market share of these different economic sectors. That is then tied to the, to the uh, political process. Okay? We're going to allow abatement from various channels, and we're going to allow a producer in each jurisdiction to determine how much is supply <coughs> of various goods, um, and given that they get some permits, okay, freely allocated to them from the government, okay, we're also going to allow a, a, a abatement to be supplied and so forth, okay. Uh, we're going to have a consumer who has some aggregate surplus, some Marshallian aggregate surplus or utility, um, where they value some consumption of this general economic good across two periods, and critically, there's some damages from emissions that they care about from the vantage point of their district, okay. Uh, I'm going to call this term, so this is, this is, this is their marginal external damages um, times their emissions level that they end up realizing in the model. This is going to be their revealed marginal external damages because I'm going to actually fit this model to a model of legislative decision making and basically recover what these preferences would need to be by legislators to justify their votes. So if this is a positive parameter, they believe di climate change causes damages. And if it's a negative parameter, they believe climate change doesn't. And in fact, may actually provide more climate change may actually provide benefits to them. I'm somewhat agnostic as to what this term is picking up. I'm not claiming to suggest that it's, it's picking up their true beliefs. It can reflect a whole number, number of factors, including whether they anticipate leakage and other forces. Um, <clears throat> but it does explain observe policy making decisions, and it's going to be a useful a mechanism for us to then simulate how legislators make decisions. Okay? There's, of course, going to be a, an equilibrium that emerges in the model, and this is going to close the model. Okay? I'm going to consider uh, this policy across several different alternative policy regimes, business as usual, where we do nothing, and then uh, different versions of the, what we, we consider an efficient cap okay, that ignores the political process entirely. Um, there are several different values of the social cost of carbon that I consider in the paper. <coughs> These are all coming from estimates that predate the passage of Waxman Marquis, because um, that's what was largely used by uh, legislators at the time the policy was passed. So I'm trying to capture the consistency with that framework. Um, $104 is on the higher end, okay, reflecting a 2.5% social discount rate. On the other end, I, have, I think a 5% discount rate is $10.10, and the central estimate is going to be $34.10. Okay. For the sake of time, I'm really going to be focusing on results for that central estimate, and I'd refer you to the paper for the other results. I also consider comparisons, assuming that legislators are making valid assessments of, uh, through the revealed marginal external damages of how they actually <coughs> value the, the damages from climate change, and I'm also not going to focus on that today. Okay? I'm going to compare these policies where I actually evaluate the welfare impacts okay, using external damages from actual scientific estimates of the social cost of carbon, uh, the central value is going to be the one I'm going to focus on. Okay, so um, <coughs> those five terms then are just really going to be what predicts policies in the model. Okay? Um, if you solve this problem for the national regulator okay, that maximizes total economic growth, uh, given the, an actual estimate of the social cost of carbon and conditional on some additional assumptions which, are, which were imposed by policymakers under a CESA, uh, we would see that the, 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 the cap that is selected is going to correspond to an equilibrium permit price that can be decomposed into two fundamental terms. Well, the first term is going to be this total emissions Pigouvian correction. This reflects the monetized damages given that social cost of carbon, given the general equilibrium change in emissions from a one unit change in emissions. That's going to be slightly higher than one because the CESA assumes 
that international offsets account for four-fifths of domestic emissions reductions. But functionally, this is going to be driven by that $34.10, or what we think the damages from climate change should be. Uh, and that's pretty standard in the economics literature. We would expect the policy to internalize those damages. In addition, because we're going to allow free trade in the rest of the world with respect to international offsets, there's going to be some cash transfer uh, when they send money to the rest of the world that they're going to account for, and there's going to be this change in the trade balance in the rest of the world if effect. Okay? Um, so that's going to provide a useful baseline. Effectively, we're considering a policy that the national government selects that maximizes national aggregate surplus, ignoring any legislative requirements. Okay? Um, <clears throat> We're going to then also have a legislative process, uh, which we're going to model as a one-shot, non-cooperative bargaining game, where each cons consumer sends a legislator to the National Assembly, and that, and that legislator is then going to have the preferences of that representative consumer in the district. Um, that can be thought of as reflecting the median voter that selected or voted for that, that particular representative. Um, we're going to allow a proposer then to propose a climate policy. I'm going to assume that that's Henry Waxman and all the models that I'm going to show you today. And under CESA, we're going to allow permits to be indirectly allocated to sectors okay, to try and convince specific legislators that we want to become yes voters to vote for the policy. Okay? Um, and we're going to allow allocations to be across economic sectors as well as se civil sectors, which are also captured in the framework. Okay? Districts may have more of a market share or exposures to certain sectors than others. Okay? That's the Delta J term. And the amount of permits they're going to get through this indirect method, where the government's picking the beta, is going to actually reflect their market shares times the sectoral allocation times the cap. So the betas here are just a slice of a pie, where we're just basically saying, OK, what some share, 35% goes to the electric power system, 2% to oil refineries, 15% to trade vulnerable industries, and so on and so forth. Given your actual market share in those industries, that's going to determine the amount that you end up receiving. Okay. Uh, times the level of the cap itself, which is E-bar. Okay. Uh, we're then going to have a model of the legislative process okay, where the government chooses, uh, chooses the beta okay, um, and the cap to maximize the proposer's uh, total aggregate surplus to their district, subject to a constraint on voting, where this VJ is a type of indicator function where it's equal to 1 if you vote for the policy or equal to 0 otherwise. And you're willing to vote for the policy if you're expected economic gain uh, under the policy exceeds that from under doing nothing. Okay? And if not, you're going to vote against the policy, and we're going to require that that is matched, that has to be greater than, the sum of all votes has to be greater than some vote threshold. In the House, that JM is effectively 50% times the total number of House districts. Okay? We're also going to require that the proposer themselves has to gain from the policy, or else they would just pick no, to, to stick with business as usual. And then that the sum of the, the allocations across districts have to sum to 1. So 35% plus, plus 15 plus 2 and so on and so forth all have to equal to 1. Okay. We're also going to consider a model of direct targeting where we don't actually force the, 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 the proposer to indirectly allocate these permits. Okay. But they instead directly are able to basically buy out legislators to secure votes by giving them exactly the amount of permits that they need. Okay. What this functionally means is that the proposer is going to have a lot of power because he's going to try and minimize the amount of permits that he has to allocate to, to, to secure the winning coalition. Okay? And then he's going to try and sequester the rest and pocket for his own district. Okay? Um, and so there's going to be a fundamental difference between these two allocation rules, indirect targeting and direct targeting, ref that's going to constrain proposer power <coughs> and the extent of hijacking. Okay? Um, <clears throat> I'm going to argue that if you solve this problem for the House, uh, this is just a unicameral legislative version of this problem. It's not going to pass. It will pass the House, um, but it's not going to pass the Senate. Okay? I also consider a bicameral version of this problem, which I'm not going to burden you with because it's going to be too miserable, um, in which it has to pass both policies of Congress. Okay? Uh, to, according to two different vote thresholds, and it depends upon whether the policy originates in the House or the Senate. Okay? So I'd refer you to the paper if that interests you. But I'm going to present results. Uh, uh, considering both models. Okay. Again, direct targeting and indirect targeting reflect two different types of political allocation rules, where the ability to direct target is a more precise method for the proposer to basically build the electoral coalition that he or she is trying to obtain, um, and indirect tar targeting a more obtuse method for doing so. Um, in addition, we've only considered the origination in the House of Representatives. 
uh, and we can modify this to account for two, uh, two different chambers and two vote thresholds, okay, and we can also consider origination. All of these different modifying of these, adding these additional policy passage constraints, changing the, court, uh, the, the uh, chamber of origination, is going to also, similar to the way indirect targeting affects direct targeting, they're going to amount to sort of types of policy passage constraints which limit proposer power, okay? And so that's going to affect the extent by which we are going to account for these things, okay? I'm also going to consider several standard non-political allocation methods, which some of you may have seen if you've taken a class on environmental economics, um, where the proposer chooses just the cap and they're forced to basically allocate permit permits on these various rules. They can allocate it based upon the expected private costs to districts uh, under the policy, the amount they contribute to abatement. We can also do it in terms of median income, so actually allocate permits to those who, uh, who have the least income, more permits to those who have the least income, and we just do it just equally. Okay? These, because they limit the ability for the proposer to basically affect the coalition that emerges, are going to constrain policy passage significantly. Okay? Um, and I'm going to actually show you that if you actually impose these allocation rules, given the revealed external damages that I estimate for legislators, actually none of these are going to pass. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, with that then, the, the policy that solves all of these different models can be reduced down to a very general expression of the national equilibrium permit price um, that reflects several terms. The first is what we call the winning coalition total emissions Pigouvian correction. This reflects the sum across all legislators in the winning coalition okay, of their revealed marginal external damages times the general equilibrium change in emissions from a one unit change in the cap. Okay. What matters here is only those who end up voting for the policy, does, is, that who, is that what the, the, the proposer has to internalize their preferences for climate change? Okay. Um, this coalition is itself going to be endogenous in the model, okay? So there has been some work that's considered just the intensive margin. This reflects sort of the well-known majoritarian bias of a legislative process. The majority gets to make the decisions, and that's whose preferences they care about, okay? Um, that's going to be uh, affect the outcomes. It's also going to be affected by who decides to join the coalition and cross an extensive margin, okay? The coalition is not going to be random because the proposer is going to pick the least cost legislators to add to their coalition. And so it's going to include all the climate believers who don't need green pork to secure their votes, um, as well as climate moderates who happen to be more capital importers or who are less polluting. Okay? Um, that's going to emerge to join the coalition. And so that's going to elevate this term to be larger than an average draw of these parameters across the legislators. Okay? Um, however, of course, this doesn't reflect everyone's damages, and it doesn't reflect the global social cost of carbon. Okay? Um, and in the model, we're going to see that this term is actually going to be less than the global social cost of carbon. <coughs> okay? And the extent that it is, that's going to push us to choose a, uh, a, a less stringent cap. Okay? That's going to reflect what we call a damage internalization distortion. The legislative process is going to account for the damages only to certain sector, to certain legislators, and not actually the true social cost of carbon. Okay? Um, <clears throat> we're going to have another change in trade balance in the rest of the world. This tends to scale with the stringency of the cap, um, and um, that's all I'm going to say about that. We're also going to have a winning coalition capital market terms of trade effect and a winning coalition permit market terms of trade effect. Uh, both of these terms uh, are going to reflect the ability of the proposer to endogenously select a coalition that's likely to consist of capital importers as well as sequester permits primarily to their own districts. Um, and so the coalition is going to be primarily uh, consisting of these, these importers of capital as well as these, um, these, these districts um, <clears throat> that receive the bulk of the permits. So they're going to be, they're going to be on, on, on average, they're going to be uh, permit sellers to everyone else who is not in the coalition. Okay? Um, <clears throat> we can de decompose this term further into two terms, sort of a canonical, conventional permit market terms of trade effect. There's a lot of notation here. Uh, given the audience, I'm not going to dwell too much on this. Um, it's likely to be non-negative and larger the greater the capacity to exactly directly target permits to, to, to secure votes. For everyone else, um, we're going to have this additional error term, which reflects the extent, and this is going to likely be negative if, if there's constraints on policy passage. So if there's, a, there's some constraints that limit the ability of the proposer to sort of secure votes, um, <clears throat> this is going to be negative, and it's going to have a general expression that varies across the different models. Okay? 
Um, <clears throat> in general, if there's exactly direct targeting that only passes a single chamber, okay, only this term emerges and this term is zero. In all other cases, this term is likely to offset the other. Okay? What we really care about, though, in terms of relative to the uh, relative to the efficient or conditionally efficient policy is this hijacking distortion, which is the sum of these two terms of trade effects. Okay, if it's greater than zero, it's going to push the cap to be more stringent, right? Because as the cap falls, the permit price gets higher. Okay, and we're going to observe that the cap is going to be, uh, the hijacking distortion can potentially di uh, dominate the damage internalization distortion if this inequality holds. Okay. Um, and actually lead to a more stringent cap than the conditionally Pareto optimal cap. Okay. Um, so that's where we're at so far. Um, how's everyone doing? I guess I should have checked in a few minutes ago, right? <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Is there any way to sort of, um, just I'm trying to make sure I'm following correctly, that mm -hmm. this is to sort of help figure out if there's a way for people who are either not affected by climate change or view climate change as a positive for their economy or, or for the groups to try and figure out how they could be convinced to vote for some sort of green pork deal? Uh, here I'm assuming, actually, I'm not, I'm not really making any strong assumptions as to what voters care about or, or, or insist upon. You can have corrupt politicians who just want money. Uh, and I don't know if you're aware of the American political system, <laughs> but I would suspect there's a few of them, <laughs> uh, if you've been watching anything on television recently. Um, so I'm, I'm actually not going to explicitly focus, uh, we're not focusing there on how sort of the, the social movement can be built or how the, uh, the investments in lobbying expenditures can be made to achieve a certain electoral outcomes. I'm simply saying, okay, given the way legislators have behaved already and to support past climate policy, um, which may reflect whether they believe climate change is real or they may believe they believe fossil fuels are the world's greatest gift, right? And don't believe climate change is a problem whatsoever. Given those constraints, okay, not, I'm not posing any value judgment on whether that's right or wrong, uh, what can pass? That's really the framework that we're thinking about. Uh, that doesn't mean that those other things are not important. Building social movements, investing in, in the right kinds of lobbying and things uh, are not critical and are, can, will play a role in practice. Um, <clears throat> I'm simply trying to evaluate, okay, uh, if we simply relax the mechanism of the way we allocate permits and actually allow that to be free, uh, to be opened up, okay, for a political process, how that affects the resulting types of policies that emerge. Any other questions? What's that? Well, I said I'll say it on the Okay, that's fine. Okay, uh, I build an economic model. I calibrate it to the year 2030. Uh, uses data from two dozen different sources. Don't have time to go into it. It's intended to reflect the EPA's intertemporal general equilibrium model, so it can be understood as a static emulator of that model. That's been descaled spatially to capture heterogeneity and, and economic costs across legislative districts. Um, I also match key model parameters so that I actually match what the EPA's predictions of expected costs are under ASESA, uh, and that was widely circulated to legislators before they were allowed to vote for the policy. Okay, whether they read it or not, I cannot say, uh, but hopefully their staffs did do so. Um, I'm also to consider the model, of the, the federal models of decision making. I'm going to need this estimate of, re <coughs> excuse me, of revealed marginal external damages, um, and to calibrate that, I principally need a value by congressional district. I use a multi-step approach, which is going to be uh, to really get in the nitty-gritty details of this is going to probably lose uh, too many of you. Then it's probably worth discussing, uh, but it basically is an attempt, okay, to search for a vector of parameters such that the model that emerges as a solution. Okay, the cap and the permit allocation to that model that I had written down it, uh, actually matches exactly okay, uh, and matches the observe vector of observed votes for the federal policy. Okay. I complement that with Pew survey data so that the voting constraints are not too uh, onerous on the model and that allows them a greater flexibility. 
Um, and in general, I find that this estimate of revealed marginal external damages uh, it does a pretty good job of explaining the, uh, the, explaining the observed votes. Okay? Um, and this is what we call sort of structural estimation or calibration of this sort of problem. Okay? Um, this is, depicts the votes for ASESA. Uh, I have it in red and blue. Uh, blue means yes, red means no. Uh, I've added these beautiful cross hashes, which might make you ill, um, in case you're colorblind. Uh, uh, the, the north west to southeast is the, is the no, and then the other is the blue, okay, is the yes. <clears throat> As you can see, votes uh, tended to be yes on the northeastern seaboard, the, western, the west uh, coast, uh, as well as pockets in the northern Midwest and other, and other places in the United States, including pockets of the southeast, okay. I believe Gene Green's district is this one right here, okay. Um, <clears throat> So that's what's driving things. I find on an average a very, very small estimate of the marginal external damages across all legislators of not even a penny. Um, that's not terribly surprising from my viewpoint, given that we don't see have a climate policy in the United States. But it's also reflecting a significant amount of heterogeneity. Okay? Uh, roughly eight cents on average per metric ton uh, is the estimate I find for yes voters, and a, a ne an almost equivalent negative version of that for no voters, reflecting skepticism. Okay. What matters, though, is the sum of these, 8 cents, across all 219 districts, and that amounts to roughly $18.37. Okay. This is still considerably less than what scientists suggest, or economists suggest, uh, given the latest scientific research, or given the scientific research from 2008, um, that we should use for climate for, for evaluating these damages, and that's $34.10. Okay. And so we're likely to see a significant damage internalization distortion that's negative. Uh, just running a simple probit model, this suggests that this, this parameter estimate explains nearly 65% of the variation in the observed ASASA votes. Uh, this, again, obscures the broad heterogeneity in these impacts across districts. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to go through this very quickly. Purple is the, <coughs> the moderate estimates. Blue is the true believers, if you will, and the red are the skeptics. Okay? Um, I don't think there's any huge surprises there <coughs> from what you can see. Okay? We can decompose this, uh, pr the equilibrium permit price that emerges as a solution to this problem okay, into its constituent components. Under a SESA, it's $28. Under the conditionally optimal cap, it's $16 because of this change in trade balance effect. Okay? This is, reflects a significant damage, neg a negative damage, inter damage internalization distortion, but a huge hijacking distortion, which is the sum of these two terms. Okay? If we just relax in the assumption of indirect targeting and move to direct targeting, that's this column that just passes the house, we see that the ability to politically allocate permits almost exactly to secure yes votes raises the equilibrium permit price by nearly $19, reflecting a significant expansion of this hijacking distortion, and more than doubling. Okay? Requiring the policy to also pass the Senate, of course, is going to naturally constrain the ability of the proposer to, to uh, target permits. And in fact, we see the price fall by nearly $9. It's still over $10 greater than the ASESO policy. Okay? The difference here is that this policy can pass the Senate under the current 60% vote threshold. Okay. We still have this sizable and significant hijacking distortion that emerges uh, when compared to the uh, conditionally Pareto optimal cap. Okay. So this dominates, it's nearly $50, dominates this damage, uh, negative damage internalization distortion. Okay. I predict that ASESA would have failed in the Senate given my estimates of revealed marginal external damages. It would have only gotten 38 votes. Uh, under all four non-political allocation rules, I find that ASESA would, the ASESA cap would not pass Congress. So if I were to consider some other way of allocating permits, it would have even done worse. It wouldn't even have passed the House of Representatives. Um, when I also allow a new cap to be chosen, reflecting that federal model that I had shown you a few slides previous, there is no solution. So not only, uh, not only will it not pass the House, it will not pass <coughs> Congress. Only a federal policy with direct targeting or some mixed allocation rule is able to pass both chambers of Congress. Okay? This shows you the distribution of green pork relative to that map of the revealed marginal external damages. That map showed that there were significant climate believers in blue on the, on the, east, on the northeastern and the, and the western seaboard and a few other places. They're not getting significant amounts of green pork because they're getting the benefits of reducing greenhouse gas emissions that they believe exist in that area. Okay? Um, those who are getting the bulk of the permits 
okay, are those on the edge who are the climate moderates, the purple, uh, the purple districts. Okay. Um, so that's what's driving the, the mechanism and this distribution of the permits across these political districts. Okay. Uh, districts that are more emissions intensive, net exporters of capital or climate moderates are more likely to receive permits so long as their vote is needed to secure uh, the policy's passage. Okay. We can also look at the impacts on emissions. For the sake of time, I'm just going to focus on the impact on my preferred federal policy, direct targeting that passes both chambers. The total amount of emissions reductions is roughly 3,500 million metric tons. The biggest contributor of this is from international offsets. The second biggest contributor is from uh, reductions in capital or fossil fuels okay, uh, across congressional districts. And this can be further decomposed into impacts by yes voters and no voters. And as you can clearly see, those who are requested to do the bulk of the abatement under the cap and trade system account for roughly uh, three-fourths of the abatement from this channel okay, uh, is going to be no voters. And these are going to be districts that do not receive permits. Okay, so these are going to be dirtier districts that emit more. <coughs> okay. uh, we can also compare this relative to the conditionally proto-optimal cap, given that social cost of carbon, and we overshoot the emissions reductions by nearly 1,100 tons. Okay, if I had changed and consider a different social cost of carbon, um, that, this conclusion changes, so this is sensitive uh, to that social cost of carbon choice. Okay. We can also consider the welfare impacts for the federal policy. The federal policy is going to achieve a welfare gain of $42 billion. Um, this can be broken down <coughs> into impacts on yes and no voters, reflecting horizontal equity. This idea that your impacts from a policy shouldn't necessarily have to do with whether you support it or not. Okay? Um, and if it does, then it's not, horizontal, it's not horizontally equitable. If it is, then it's horizontally regressive. Okay? I find, uh, really tied back to the previous slide by which we saw that the, 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 those districts that require to abate the most are the no voters they lose from the climate policy. And those districts that vote yes, they, they are required to reduce their emissions less, and they're getting a bulk of permits. In fact, for every $2 that the yes voting districts gain, the no voters would lose in this scenario. Okay? Um, so this is, means that the policy that's likely to pass is going to have some significant equity impacts across districts okay? um, that are significant. Okay? Uh, the preferred federal policy is likely to reflect some magnitude of political failure. Here I find it's roughly $16 billion because it overshoots the conditionally proto-optimal cap. Okay? We can also compare this using standard vertical equity measurements where we actually compare the impacts, the, the net damages in the economy basically to each legislative district normalized by the aver across, average across the household, normalized by the average median income in that district. Okay, so this is the share of damages. Positive number means on net they're paying to, they're paying, their district is paying to uh, implement this cap, and negative means they're losing, uh, sorry, they're, they're gaining from the cap, and negative means they're losing, okay, from the cap, okay. Uh, the ASESA climate policy is here. It's neither progressive nor regressive. The really severe problem where we have maximum proposer power, direct targeting that just passes the House, is here. And as you can see, the one that's in between, okay, it fits right in between, it's going to achieve negative impacts for three of the in lowest income quantiles. And it's going to have a huge positive impact okay, on, the positive, on the top income qu quantile. Okay? Um, and so... <coughs> That is the main conclusion here, and a small negligible change in the lowest income quantile. Okay? Uh, the greater ability to directly target permits is going to imply greater regressivity. In addition, the characteristics most correlated with no votes, that is, they have higher emissions intensity of capital, and so it's more costly for them to abate, that have low revealed marginal external damages, and that are net capital exporters, tends to be correlated with income. So the resulting policy that emerges that's both feasible um, is going to be also uh, vertically uh, regressive as well. Okay? Um, so far, I've only focused on this, these pure political rules. We can also consider mixed rules. I can also relax the assumption that the policy passes in the, in the, in the Senate with a 60% vote threshold. I can lower it to 50%. I can also consider policies in the instead of originate in the Senate. Okay? Uh, I relax all these assumptions. This reflects roughly 400 simulations. Um, the black values reflect okay, the uh, the uh, simulations <coughs> under House origination, okay, uh, then it goes to the Senate under, and the solid here depicts a 60% Senate vote threshold, the dash a 50% Senate vote threshold, the gray depicts origination in the Senate rather than the House, 
Okay, if you originate in the Senate, that means it's, you do more diffusely allocate permits, which makes it much more difficult to achieve a really uh, stringent climate policy to emerge. Okay, um, <clears throat> and again, the same. So a 60% vote threshold and a 50% Senate, Senate vote threshold. On this axis here, I'm actually varying the amount of permits that are set aside for redistribution. So a value of zero on the solid black line is the preferred federal policy that I've been t talking about all along. Okay, and these are all different simulations. Okay. Um, so as we move from here to here, all the permits are being allocated for redistribution. You'll notice that the black line that we've been talking about actually ends roughly at 92% because there's no policies that actually emerge that solve the problem past 92%. Okay. Uh, the panel on the left depicts the average green pork needed to secure a yes voter, and the panel on the right depicts the average green pork needed to secure a no voter. As you can see, if you originate the policy in the House, the average green pork needed to secure a yes vote is high relative to uh, the other situations, okay, and low, okay, and, and also high in the, in the, in the, in if you, and also high for no voters, okay. Uh, for the Senate, it's much lower. But there is a pretty substantial uh, shift here in the magnitudes that are being required. So um, here require roughly uh, 25, uh, 0.25 billion, okay, and here roughly 0.75 billion, okay. Um, as you can see, actually uh, lowering, lowering the Senate vote threshold of 50% actually requires me to use more green pork, okay, to pay off those, to pay off those no voters. Um, <clears throat> and that is in part because that empowers a more stringent cap to emerge that reflects greater hijacking, which imposes even greater disproportionate impacts on no voters. Okay? Um, so given these measures, <clears throat> and then as we allocate more permits for redistribution, I need, less, I need less available for the political allocation. So these are all downward sloping as we would expect. Okay? Um, given this, um, this basically means we can construct what we call a vulnerability index, where we take the average amount of green pork from a no voter and compare it to the average green pork for a yes voter. Um, effectively, that that amounts to is where we were to just shock, suppose a yes voter doesn't exist. Suppose their vote doesn't come through. And we have to go to the pool of no voters to bring them in. How, uh, how do I substitute uh, those, those individual voters across districts? Okay? This is a measure of the vulnerability, I would argue, of the climate policy. And as you can see, the preferred federal policy, when no permits are withheld for redistribution, has the lowest vulnerability index. If we were to actually change the Senate vote threshold to 50%, it actually raises the vulnerability index, even if you were to change the shares of permits set aside for redistribution. And if you were to actually change the origination to the Senate, it's also going to raise the vulnerability. Okay? So the policy that is most feasible is going to be the preferred federal policy with pure direct targeting. Okay, that originates in the House with a 60% vote threshold. The reason why this goes up for the, uh, 50, the raising the threshold is because it becomes more costly to pay off those no voters because of this extenuated, this additional hijacking distortion that emerges. Okay, um, <clears throat> so that's a surprising result, <coughs> and suggests that current policies to originate uh, to change the Senate vote threshold uh, may give us some pause. Okay. Um, <coughs> okay. Uh, I also find little support for originating the policy in the, in the Senate as opposed to the House. And this is because there's less green pork generated under Senate origination. And so there's less of a capacity to replace the yes voter with a no voter in that case. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we can also depict the impacts on the, the relative impacts relative to the conditionally Pareto optimal cap. As you can see, actually changing the permits that we set aside for redistribution can get us closer to efficiency. We can almost get exact efficiency. Um, um, however, that comes at an implicit trade-off with feasibility. Okay? So we can get closer to the efficient policy, but that's going to mean that it's likely we're going to emerge the less feasible policy. Okay? I again see that the 60% the 60, the 60 vote threshold, though, clearly dominates that 50% vote threshold uh, in these cases. Okay? Um, <clears throat> we can also look at regressivity impacts. Basically, a positive value of this for yes voters means it's regressive. A negative value means it's progressive for, uh, sorry, for no voters and for yes voters. Uh, as you can see, uh, the more ability to directly allocate permits, the more regressivity. We can fix that problem by setting some permits aside for redistribution. Um, and we can actually choose a policy that balances both efficiency and equity trade-offs. But again, that's all going to push us to a less feasible climate policy. Okay. 
Um, <clears throat> and I'm not going to go through this. You can calculate trade-off indices uh, across these three dimensions as well. Okay? So in policy contexts in which we have a private good co-produced with a public good, which I would say is almost any environmental context and many other non-environmental contexts, uh, we're likely to have this significant hijacking distortion. And it's, I've shown that numerically it can be quite large in the context of climate change. Uh, we see overshooting. We see that policy that emerges. It, does, it leads to a political failure of roughly $16, uh, $16 billion. Uh, and the feasible policy is likely to be both vertically and horizontally regressive. Okay? I find little support to, for current proposals to lower the Senate vote threshold to 50% or alternatively pass the climate policy through reconciliation, which would only require it to pass 50%. It would increase vulnerability. Doing so would increase vulnerability while reducing efficiency and equity. Okay? Uh, so in that case, it's not even, it's, it's really a non-starter. Okay? This assumes, though, our social cost of carbon. Uh, originating the policy in the Senate would increase efficiency and equity, but also come at an implicit trade-off with policy vulnerability. <coughs> okay? We can correct some of the issues of efficiency and equity by setting aside permits for redistribution, but that also increases vulnerability. Uh, and the final take-home message, uh, even if you don't buy the specifics of the economic model that I have written down, is that the political allocation of permits uh, is going to be necessary to achieve comprehensive climate policy that passes both chambers, but it's going to also imply trade-offs on both efficiency and equity. Okay? There are caveats, of course, for the sake of time, and because I'm more interested in hearing your voices rather than mine, I'm going to simply leave it here. Okay, and leave you with my contact information in case you would like to send me uh, emails on how much you enjoyed or hated my talk. And take questions uh, from our audience. Okay, thank you very much. Let's give... <laughs> Any questions, including, did anyone realize that our legislators were going through such detailed math when they decided whether to vote for a policy or not? <laughs> uh, any questions? Um, how does this compare in the, to the context of the California program that exists in terms of attempting to price and allocate permitting? So the oh, you mean the California cap and trade system? Yeah. Yeah, this uh, entirely ignores the California cap and trade system. Um, that would be a type of overlaid uh, state policy that would overlay with the federal policy. Um, this focus, you can really think about this as sort of considering the vantage point of the 2009 latest legislative assembly. So before the cap and trade system in California had really had a chance to sort of become in full force. Um, California currently will have its own cap and trade system. <coughs> it currently does. Um, that will impact, if to the extent there would be <coughs> overlap of a federal system, it would overlap and interact in, in, in good ways and non-good ways uh, with the federal cap and trade system. I was just curious if the modeling itself could be applied to that smaller context. Oh, yes, it could, it could be certainly applied to that context and considered the legislative process in California. But you hadn't done the, that, that assessment of it, the model of, of California? No, or, no. I do have another project that actually does look at California's waiver authority, but that's, not what I, that's uh, a totally different piece of the uh, sort of federal uh, environmental policymaking landscape that we're not considering in this, in this particular paper. But thank you for the question. Right. I'll ask a, a question while we get to the other one. So you mentioned, you know, a successful cap and trade policy, the sulfur emissions yeah. trading. Um, can you give any insights as to the how your analysis or how the literature applies to that, Let's, such as you don't have to buy off as many legislators or something because it may be mostly targeting coal plants and there's less places where there's coal plants and maybe the costs were lower. Is there any kind of general insight how we that you can have to compare? Yeah, so, I mean, Jurasco and Chamalinzi, it's largely a narrative paper that it sort of explains how the political process works. There's no formal modeling. This is a, a more formal modeling. Uh, I would argue that that particular allocation of permits under the acid rain program uh, was slightly different. There they sort of allowed sort of legislators to sort of bid on how much permits they wanted. And then based upon their percentages, they then ratcheted them all down proportionately. So if the percentages exceeded 100%, uh, they then ratcheted them all down. Uh, those sort of ratcheting mechanisms would probably alleviate some of the hijacking distortion that would emerge in this sort of a SESA type model, uh, but it's going to come at a cost of political feasibility. Um, <coughs> so uh, that's going to be your implicit trade-offs uh, that, that, that emerge in that case. Um, and 
<clears throat> there are certainly other ways to think about these political allocation of permits in that case. Did I answer your question? I don't think I did. Uh, I was kind of wondering just how you might think of it as do you, in the, in the climate change, you're thinking, okay, I've got uh, the entire suite of how representatives yeah. you're thinking about sulfur emissions or yeah. acid rain. Maybe there's a subset. There's that some are, districts that don't have a anything. much smaller subset that are interested and yeah. have to be bought off. And is it make it inherently easier uh, or, or something like this? Uh, all it would mean that basically they have no abatement costs. Um, and so you could have a political system that says, oh, we, that's fine. We don't allow a permits to be allocated to those districts. Or you could just say, you're willing to vote yes? I'll give you some. But you just have no abatement costs, so it's all going to be just straight cash for you. It's going to be revenue that you get to sell and use for whatever you purpose you want. Okay? So you can think of the political allocation here as a sort of being allocated uh, for the legislator to distribute internally however they would like. Okay? So they could use it to pay to consumers if they want to pay consumers and actually compensate them for lower electricity bills, for example, that might rise for the acid, for the acid rain program. So you might still want to allocate permits to deal with regressivity even in that case, even if they have no, uh, no, no power generating units in that case, for example. Gentleman in the back. Yes. Um, hi. hi. Uh, given that there's a, a functional ban on earmarks in the current legislature, mm. um, how do you allocate green pork um, in any sort of climate policy or any bill that you pass through the House and Senate? Well, green pork isn't classified as an earmark. Yeah, it's an allocation of permits under a cap-and-trade system. It's not, an earmark is effectively a specific uh, rider or attachment to some other policy. I guess it doesn't have to be. It tends to be. Uh, that it, it specifies a certain amount of funds to, uh, to be allocated to a particular district, typically for a particular project. Um, <coughs> those can be banned. But here we're talking about negotiating over a cap-and-trade system where you get to allocate the permits however you wish. Um, or alternately, the same framework can be applied to consider a carbon tax system in which you legislators get to determine how they wish to allocate revenue across districts. Okay? So in any general case, I mean, the government's going to be able to raise revenue from certain policy actions. It's the, the legislative process is going, to is going to resolve what that revenue gets to be used for. Um, same is true whether that is revenue from a, a, a sort of carbon tax or revenue from the sale of permits. Does that make sense? Um, so, uh, to my understanding, those restrictions on earmarks don't apply to any sort of environmental regulation and in many other contexts. Just those specific riders that get attached to bills, there's specific cash transfers to just explicit districts. And in fact, you might argue this is probably easier to get through because it comes with the cap and trade system, and which provides benefits to everyone. Let me ask a, uh, another question. So, one of the, I suppose, uh, uh, some, some of my prominent uh, uh, ideas for the policy that seems neutral. Uh, I, th I think you've roughly said the answer. I'll just ask you to state it again. Let's just say you have a, a carbon fee and dividend policy. The dividend just goes back to consumers. Uh, how does that play out with the way you're thinking the analysis that just inherently makes it a less probable uh, outcome given the legislative process? Is this the general kind of takeaway in the, in the terms of the lines of analysis you're doing here? Um, yeah, it so... It takes, um, takes away a, a degree of freedom for the legislators, so they just don't have this bargaining anymore. Right. If you did a cap and dividend type of approach, uh, the most of those that have been discussed have been, would provide a, a dividend directly to consumers. Uh, to my knowledge, there's been no discussion on <laughs> saying, okay, you're, you're a consumer in Alabama, you don't vote for the policy, you don't get any of the cap and dividend. Right? Uh, I've not seen anything like that. I'm suggesting... Uh, such a system uh, would, would uh, inhibit the, uh, the ability for the policy to get passed. Uh, although it might be, uh, merit, have merits in other dimensions, that would be the trade-off. Now, what actually happened in Ursesa was there was some fraction of permits set aside, presumably for some consumer uh, climate refund, similar to a type of cap and dividend. That's captured in the model, actually. Um, and you can think of the exogenous permits that are set aside for redistribution as potentially allowing for that. So you could use that portion as a cap and dividend, and this would show you how that gets traded off. Um, it does suggest, however, that, I mean, uh, the political allocation mechanisms is going to be important to buy out the votes, um, but a legislator who gets the permits can decide what they want to do with them internally. So they could theoretically implement a cap and trade, uh, a, a dividend system internally, 
uh, but it would just mean that if you voted no for the policy, uh, your, the amount of money for that cap and dividend would be much less, and we're going to affect the distributional impact. So you're going to violate horizontal equity and, and vertical equity. Let's follow up. So you brought up something I guess I hadn't actually thought about, which it was interesting, and maybe is, you already, already know the answer from your analysis. So yeah, if, if a legislator votes for a policy and it passes, then they get an allocation, let's just say, they were going to just distribute a dividend to everyone in their district, and yeah. anybody who voted against it, against it was not. Um, is, is that kind of concept captured in, in, your, in your analysis here, or would that be a, a slight variation? Because I could see people, I mean, there, there would be a tendency, it seems, for people to say, well, yes, I'm going to, once you start getting close to the number of people to pass, then to be the next person that votes for it, you're like, oh, I might be the last person to get an allocation but then, and pass the vote, but then once it gets to a passing vote, everybody's going to want to vote for it because they're either losing, they're going to get nothing, <laughs> and, the, and it's going to pass. <laughs> right? so, uh, so then all of a sudden you get to 50 or something or 60, and then it's going to go to 100 because you're like, well, it's passed, so I better get in something. Yeah, that's an interesting question. So if you know that the policy is going to pass anyway, um, do you strategically anticipate uh, that it will pass and then instantaneously change your vote? <laughs> uh, it's possible. Um, that would require a level of forethought by our legislative assembly that is, uh, is, is, is substantive. I mean, as a, as a uh, it, it raises interesting questions I, should, I need to think more about. Um, but in terms of Waxman Marquee itself, I mean, this is a policy that literally Henry Waxman was, they were, they were adding 600 pages as it was under vote to this bill. And they, uh, people were, I didn't discuss all this in the overview. In the paper, I gave a legislative overview of how it got passed. I mean, they were giving carve outs, uh, both in green pork and in other sort of uh, ways they designed the policy to particular districts to get votes. Um, and he, they were literally adding, adding sections to the policy to get it passed. Um, whether uh, that would mean that everyone jumps in, not necessarily. In this process, first come, first serve. Pork is gone, pork is gone. You're going to have to move to other, to other mechanisms to get it. In a context like the acid rain program, uh, you'd probably see that more of that strategic bundling emerge, where the ratcheting, is, uh, ratcheting scales up. Yeah. Any other questions uh, for those in here? There is a Long Hunter Energy Club happy hour at uh, Crown and Anchor immediately after this, so they'll be going there with the speaker. Um, if there's not any other questions, we can allocate ourselves to beer. Uh, Everyone's invited. It's yes. not exclusive to green the Long Hunter Energy Club. All right. Yeah. We might have some green beer. All right. So <laughs> well, let's thank uh, Joel for uh, an extremely insightful talk. Uh, thank, thank you all you for much. having me. Uh, enjoyed being here. Thanks.